Seven. Why, why am I doing this to myself? Why do I do this? I need, I need professional help. I need professional help. Do you have a phone number of a like, um, psychologist? Hello, noble ones. Welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking and today we are going full old school because I'm taking you for a spin throughout all series of articles on the internet that teach us a lot of very good, interesting things about the medieval period. And uh, well, fun for you, not for me. I'm risking a heart attack here every time I open one. But the things I do for you. The things I do for you. Let's go. Ranker.com. I don't even know how I find these. Um, historical armor that made us say, whoa written by this person, probably under the effect of COVID. As long as humans have been trying to poke each other with sharp things, armor has been a practical necessity. But one thing remains consistent, you want to look good while you're wearing it. Well, I've got to say, so far so good. I absolutely agree. Look at this handsome man. Of course, suits of armor had their own pitfalls as a clickable hyperlink. Should I click it? Should I, um, I'm not gonna click it. For medieval combatants, but that doesn't negate the evocative nature of armor itself. So the first one is Hercules armor of the, yeah, that's a very famous suit of armor from 1555. I don't particularly like the ones that are so elaborate, like it's, it's a bit much to be 100% honest with you. I get it, Maximilian II had a lot of money to waste. Number two, Italian infantry armor from 1570. Hmm. I think that's French. Bonjour. I honestly think that's French. But looking at the great background, I'm thinking this is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Either that or Wallace Collection, they both love that grey tint in the back. You should really go for blue. Blue. But my guess is Metropolitan Museum of Art. Let's see if we can find the original. Also because they are... I'm curious for the helmet. Found it. The Met. I was right. <laughs> Every time we go to New York, my wife... <laughs> Poor beauty has to go through the whole section of arms and armor listening to me and every possible detail she doesn't care for but she's adorable so she she plays along infantry armor upper plate and gorget that's a french yeah french I, I was right french but i mean it's probably in the italian it has some italian style in the culture yeah culture italian so there you go so they're not completely wrong i've got to say yeah okay let's continue no i can't i just can't continue i need to click on that hyperlink i just have to i have to know who i'm dealing with I'm clicking it. Seven. Why, why am I doing this to myself? Why do I do this? I need, I need professional help. I need professional help. Do you have a phone number of a like, um, psychologist, psychiatrist? Seven ways medieval knight armor was more dangerous than wearing nothing. Okay. So let me get this straight. If you've been a subscriber to this channel for a few years, you know that I have actually debunked already, many years ago, this whole wearing medieval armor was worse than, than wearing nothing nonsense. But this, not only it, it looks like some kind of copycat, but they actually added. So this has the potential of being even worse than the one that I debunked. Oh my gosh, it is worse. Do what? How can you make an article? on anything that has to do with the medieval period and then link, put a hyperlink to this, to this monstrosity, to this disgrace, to this 85,000 views. It's from 2021. This is a new rendition. This is even worse than the original. I've got to, I've got to do it. I have to do it. I have to because no one else, I have to do it. I have to do it. <laughs> Already the first word in the, in the article, chain mail. Chain mail and suits of armor were some of the most recognizable parts of medieval warfare, but there were several tactic combatants could use to kill their opponents. I want to see what kind of tactics you think would work against a suit of plate armor. So there are plenty of ways you can die wearing a suit of armor. There are also plenty of ways you can die inside a tank, which doesn't mean that the tank doesn't... Oh my gosh. Heat exhaustion, piercing from arrows, stabbing wounds and cavalry charges. Hold on a minute. I think there is a major misunderstanding here. Piercing from arrows, stabbing wounds, and cavalry charges are among the very things that you wear a suit of armor to avoid dying of. Yep. Go get them, lad. You could roast alive from heat. Yeah, that one is from the original one, I remember it. Combatants were fighting each other in the desert while wearing metal suits. As you might imagine, this led to people being literally baked. Okay, Gen Z. 
being literally baked inside their armor and eventually perishing from heat exhaustion. <laughs> literally baked. Oh my gosh. That was... Luckily, many soldiers discovered ways to get around the heat. Some took their armor off entirely. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful idea while you're on a battlefield fighting your opponent. You're like, yeah, you know, it's too hot here. Let me just take everything off. Others discovered that covering up the armor with cloth prevented direct sunlight from heating the metal up to the cooking point. Cooking point of metal. Let me give it a try. But now I'd like to take a moment of your time to let you know that today we have partnered with Geology to bring you this sponsored video. Geology is a 26-time award-winning skin, hair and body care company that creates simple and effective skincare and hair care routines customized just for you. Their products are built around just a handful of powerful proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Plus, believe it or not, I myself have got a little bit of a skincare routine. Nothing complicated, of course, but it's something I've been doing for quite a few months now. It's almost a year. And, uh, you know, it's important, I think, to take care of yourself. And I think it's working for me because, I mean, I'm in my 40s. So it was great to get their products because since moving to the US I've had a little bit of a dry skin problem and their products are great because they are simple to use. Little moisturizing, morning and evening. So far this one is my favorite product, it feels good, it has a nice scent, the lather is, is a pleasure to apply. Then they also have this product here and as someone who has struggled with insomnia for a lot of years, just when you get a couple of those nights and you still want to, you know, in my case film a video but in general you want to interact with people this is a good one. The thing I like the most about Geology's skincare routine is the fact that they are tailored for each individual, which makes the routine easy and most importantly, natural. Geology has distilled skincare to its essentials with trusted dermatologist approved ingredients and over 7,000 five star reviews, so people love it. So here's how it works. You click the link provided, you take a 30 seconds diagnostic quiz and with a few clicks, tell them about your skin and goals and their team of dermatologists will design a personalized routine just for you that is shipped directly to your door. There has never been a better time to try Geology products than right now. For a very limited time, click the link in the description below or use the QR code and enter the code METATRON100 to get a 100% off of your personalized skincare routine. That's right, they're giving you a free trial of their 26 times award-winning skincare products. On top of that, they'll give you a 30% off of an additional bonus offer on a skin, hair or body care add-on of your choice when you add it to your trial. Click the link in the description, get it before it's gone and as always, massive thanks to Geology for sponsoring my video. You could get completely blindsided, that's another new one. The helmets that one wore with armor were incredibly adapted at protecting one's head. Unfortunately, that came at the price of completely ruining someone's peripheral awareness. In the midst of combat, it could be pretty easy to come up behind someone and take them out. Yeah, very easy. Stranger, it's never mentioned in the sources, but peripheral. Okay, let me show you peripheral. So first of all, the thing we need to remember is that it really depends on what helmet you're talking about. And I imagine this person is not mentioning the helmets that are open-faced for obvious reasons. But then again, we also need to remove all the helmets, including the one that he has in a picture that has a vi that have a visor. Because if you have a visor, you can just lift the freaking thing and see everything. But even with helmets that are fully enclosing and don't have a visor, I happen to have two, here is what happens to my peripheral vision. This is my peripheral vision while wearing this replica of a 14th century Pembridge Great Helm. The same. And here is my peripheral vision wearing a full-on frog mouth. Very similar to the one they have a, a couple of pictures down below. So peripheral vision isn't that affected with closed helmets. A little bit. But what's really affected is the vision underneath the lower end of my vision. That is absolutely very much impaired while wearing a helmet, even more so with my frog mouth because it has no perforations. You know, the kind of holes that you use for breathing, my version doesn't have it, some do. Very much depends on the helmet. With my great helm, I can actually see through the holes, but once again, yes, the lower part, not really good, 
but I can always lower my head to look down and remember that if I'm mounted, as the majority of knights were, the exception being in England, then I have my horse's head here, which is already taking much of that space anyways. But this is honestly one of the main problems with people writing these articles. They have never worn any historically accurate replica of armor, and therefore they have no idea. They can just imagine. They don't read anything that actually describes things from the perspective of either the people in period or reenactors today. If you appreciate my mental distress, please show your support by subscribing to my channel and becoming a noble one. Thank you. You could get stabbed between the plates. Plated armor was nearly invincible in its heyday. Sword slasher is absolutely nothing to it, which meant fighters had to get clever to get their cut in. So far so good. Armor didn't cover everything. There were gaps that one could exploit near the groin, in the neck and under the armpits. <sighs> So yeah, there are a few weak spots in armor, which means you're better off wearing nothing. This is um, excellent advice. Just don't wear anything. Just go naked, you know, like the ghouls. Naked. Mike, my soul is cringing. Have you ever seen a spirit cringing? That's me. This is, this, okay. You expend twice the amount of energy to move around. You might expect full armor to be incredibly restrictive in some ways that was true, but you might also be surprised by just how much mobility some of these knights had. Appreciate that. Okay, now they're talking about the Battle of Agincourt and the fact that there was mud. Marching through that, the mud, in 50 kilograms of armor made the French troops incredibly tired before they even had a chance. 50 kilo. Well, there was no 50 kilograms armor when it comes to field armor, so like battlefield armor. 50 kilograms is really the highest end of the spectrum. It's not, it's not even every case, but the highest end of the spectrum possible in tournament armor. Because again, during a tournament, you're not going to have to walk, who knows for how long, in mud, in full armor, or in general, you don't have to act as a soldier does on the field. Field suits between 20 kilograms to 25 kilograms, so half as much, even less, 40% of what you're saying is the norm. Why do people think the medieval people were idiots? An idiot would do that. And then like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I wish there was someone here from 2021 who could tell me that, oh, you shouldn't do that because it could be tiring. You're gonna die before you can even fight. And yet these people build cathedrals and incredible architecture. You could still be beaten to death. Say what? When you're surrounded by metal, it can make it pretty difficult for people to stab you. That doesn't mean, however, you can't get a concussion or succumb to internal bleeding. Uh, things such as the mace or the hammer made good use of the fact that steel could dent and cave into its wearer. A good whack to the head. A good whack. To the head would still do plenty of damage with enough force to behind it. Okay. On this channel, I have said over the years that maces and warhammers can absolutely double down as anti armor weapons in the sense that it does help when you're fighting someone and he's wearing a helmet or they're wearing plate. Uh, sometimes it's not a bad idea to actually use some concussive force because you're not going to be able to cut through it and piercing is going to be extremely difficult, sometimes impossible depending on the armor that you're encountering. This doesn't mean that it's easy to dent armor and it really depends on what armor you're facing. If it's heat treated steel, good luck denting that with a mace and the only strength of your arms. Not gonna happen. If you're fighting someone who's wearing like off the shelf, very uh, cheap iron or maybe even like very low carbon steel that of course can't be hit treated, particularly if it's mild steel, then sure, yeah, it could happen. But it's still better to wear something. This is the thing that I don't understand about these lists. Oh, you're wearing a helmet, but if they hit you in the head, it might still stun you. Still better than being hit on my head without a helmet with a mace. If you do that, it's gonna crack my skull automatically. So, uh, still better. And this is on the vi- This is, I can't believe it's a point on an article called Seven Ways Medieval Armor Was More Dangerous Than Just Wearing Nothing. This is ridiculous. You, you could be shot by arrows. While it's true that armor protected people from arrows, there were a number of variables that led to how effective that protection actually was. First and foremost, distance was a huge factor. From a long distance, arrows wouldn't do too much but at a closer range, arrows designed to pierce armor could poke right through. If it's mail, sure, a good bodkin arrow can absolutely go through mail, but through good, well-made plate, good luck with that. 
I'm not saying it's completely impossible, once again it depends on what the armor is made of and where in the armor it hits. There are areas of the armor, like the sides for example, where the metal can be thinner. In fact, there are historical accounts of uh, medieval knights complaining that their visors, movable parts of their helmets, were being pierced from the sides. But the way this guy makes it sound is that, well, good RO, if it's from close range, is gonna go through that breastplate. No, if an archer is shooting at you and you're a knight at close range, he is trying to shoot through the gaps. He's not gonna, oh yeah, I'm gonna shoot him in the center of mass. You couldn't run away from your opponent for very long. While you had decent mobility in a suit of armor, that didn't mean you could just run around the battlefield swinging your sword. That is exactly what you're expected to do as a soldier, man-at-arm, medieval knight, what have you, is to, well, not exactly run around, but I mean, that, that's why you are mounted usually, because the horse does the running. But anyways, you're supposed to move around the battlefield quickly if needed, swinging your weapon. So no, that is exactly what you are expected to do in full armor. Depending on various factors, a full suit of armor could weigh up to a hundred pounds or more. And here we are, back to the nonsense. <sighs> yeah, in Warhammer, chaos. Absolutely, you know, the armor, the plate armor is actually made in hell in Warhammer, which is probably why. That armor would probably weigh a hundred pounds. Thank you. Swinging a sword in addition to donning a metal suit can get pretty tiring at times. It also meant, well, yeah, war is tiring. I mean, even today, please, I'm not a soldier, well, I'm, I'm a former Navy, but ask any soldier veteran out there, please, if you're watching this and you're a veteran and you were carrying your modern gear, not full plate armor, modern gear, can it get tiring? Is it tiring to go around, not even on the battlefield, just being a soldier and walking around in full gear? Let them know in the comments below what soldiers are supposed to do. And thank you for your service. It also meant running around would eventually wear you down far quicker than if you weren't wearing all that metal. And it also meant that you wouldn't die as quickly if you were running around without wearing all that metal, but yeah. Anyways, uh, this was the uh, article. It was absolutely horrible, but the thing is, there is a red button and it says next up. Should I click it or should I not? Should I click it? Oh, of course I'm gonna click it. Medieval peasants designed their own perfect utopia and it was still super depressing. Interesting that she puts still super depressing. I mean, this really kind of gives me the idea that you think the medieval life for peasants was super depressing, which I mean, sure, it was harder than today's life in general for obvious reasons, but medieval peasants actually had a lot more holidays than we modern people do. We, we work more, so there's that. But anyways, let's see, maybe, maybe I'm just misjudging them. Medieval peasants imagined a fantasy land where all their desires were fulfilled. It was called cocaine, which rhymes with Spain, and it was super depressing. Hmm. Yeah, I'm familiar with the story, but let's see what they say about it. The land of cocaine is a simple place. The houses are made from fish pies and roasted pigs walk around with knives in their back for easy eating. Egg grew legs so that peasants could indulge while lying on the ground and animals pooped in baskets for cle easy cleanup. Well, I mean, yeah. In an imaginary world with endless possibilities, the medieval myth of cocaine focused on two things, food and laziness. Listen, I don't think, as modern people, we really are in a position to point the finger at medieval people and call them lazy, or like, ah, you, you, all you like is being lazy. We hop on a car for a 200 meters trip because we don't want to walk. They walked everywhere. People walked to France from Italy. They walked it. The medieval world was incredibly physical when you compare it to modern times and how easy we have it. Oh, we are hungry, DoorDash. Oh, you're hungry in the medieval people, go hunt. Go work the fields, unless of course you're a nobleman. Then they will feed you, I suppose it's kind of a kind of a Uber Eats, but medieval style. Still, I wouldn't call medieval nobles lazy because I mean, they had, they were trained in combat. They were learning how to fight, how to joust, how to don armor. I mean, can you say the same about our politicians? Can you imagine our politicians being ready for MMA style combat or like, you know, wearing armor and jousting? At least medieval politicians actually went to the wars in armor and fought in tournaments. You wanna say lazy again? Not even the politicians are lazy in the medieval period. 
Cocaine is proof that life for medieval peasants was pretty bad since their utopia was essentially a medieval version of the dystopia in Wall E. I haven't got a clue what that is, but I still don't understand the depressing part. They wanted to have a situation where, yeah, they can get food and they can skip some of the daily tasks that, to be honest, is not even just medieval. I mean, cleaning off their animals and taking care of the dung so you can use it as manure in the fields. This is stuff that farmers today do. And even though we've got mechanized stuff, there are a lot of people they still work with their hands on the fields and I mean if you tell them hey could would you like it you know to live in a place where where all of this stuff does itself all of this stuff is automated in a way they're imagining our times so if you think that they're lazy what does that tell you about us in a fantasy land with endless possibilities what medieval peasants really wanted was easy meat and again you you consider this as something weird but meat wasn't something that everyone could afford eating so the idea that a peasant who perhaps had to sell the meat from from a pig but couldn't eat for example chicken because a laying bird is very important for someone who's trying to support himself and a family killing a lame bird is something that a nobleman can do so chicken was actually rather expensive it's a commodity to be able to eat that so that they dreamt eating meat it's because it was expensive so it's a diff for you meat is two dollars at mcdonald's there's nothing depressing about it medieval peasant thought houses made of fish sounded appetizing don't tell these guys about the houses for Hansel and Gretel made of candy. It'll make their houses of fish look pretty sad. According to 14th century English poem, The Land of Cocaine, the walls of all the houses in the utopia are made of fish pies. If that doesn't sound very appetizing, look to the roofs where flower cakes are be other shingles. Okay, um, I don't like fish. If you change fish pies into pork pies, I'll join in. Not to mention, I mean, flower cakes are the shingles. That's, uh, that's great. That's fantastic. But once again, oh, fish pies, they're so stupid. And then you go and get filet of fish at McDonald's. Because I know you did. That's what you ordered yesterday night. That is what you ordered. Filet of fish. Interestingly enough, peasants did get to enjoy some fish that, for example, salmon. Modern History TV, so Jason actually had an episode on this fantastic, I'll put a link in the description where it shows that, you know, some stuff that would be considered gourmet today, like a nice slice of salmon with some interesting sauces, was something that peasants had access to. Medieval food really depends on the area and there are lots of differences, but uh, in general, you know, you have a river, you can fish, you can get the fish, you can cook it, and they, you know, so they had access to that. I'm sure they enjoyed their fish uh, very much. So I don't see this again it's of course it has to be seen through the lenses of their dietary habits and also the availability of food at the time which as i mentioned before doesn't only change because of the era but it also changes because of depending on the country for for example as a favored fat for cooking olive oil was very common in medieval italy but butter was actually more used in northern nordic countries and to be honest whenever i read about food in the medieval period, whether it be fantasy like this, imaginary food, or whether it be actual recipes, I always imagine that the food must have tasted really good. Because to be honest, it was fresh, it was always in season, because you can only eat stuff that was in season. It didn't have as many chemicals as modern food has. It didn't have as many processed ingredients. It must have been very genuine. And to me, it's, it sounds succulent, to use an interesting word for it. So I don't know, I don't know. I think this, 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 the rubbish that we eat today in comparison. Cocaine has a major advantage over heaven, wine. Oh yeah, that's the thing about the two types. I remember something about two types of wine. See if I remember correctly. For medieval peasants, in addition to the abundance of meat, cocaine is a utopia because it has rivers of wine. Oh, my dad would love that. Peasants who wet, you see, my dad is from the north of Italy, so like they, they drink wine in the morning, like... <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Peasants who were tired of drinking water probably loved the promise that water uses there a few for washing in and for the view. Notice how it's interesting because they took this, it's, this is an original passage from the story, one of the versions, and as you can see, they're mentioning water as something used for washing. So it kind of, I, I, I wish they would have used this opportunity to underline the fact that once again it is a myth the medieval peasants would have been dirty because as you can see, in, in their fantasy world, water is directly associated with washing yourself rather 
them for drinking because they're like, yeah, you don't want to drink water, drink wine, uh, which I think it's, it's really funny. And in fact, it's a point of connection. Rather than using these stories to poke fun and saying, oh, so depressing, I think instead it's great to connect them to the way we humans are. I think this is a joke that would work even today. Water, I use that for shower. A real man drinks wine. I think it's fun. Uh, it's, it's something that would absolutely work on us too, regardless of the fact that we're talking about 600 years of difference. Sometimes I feel I can relate more to medieval people than I can to Gen Z. <sighs> Literally. If peasants were too lazy to move, cocaine also invented food that flies right into your mouth. Anyways, I think I've subject myself, subjected myself to enough mental torture, erosion for today, and I believe my IQ has already lowered at least 15 points. So I'm going to call it today. I hope that you enjoyed it and I also hope there was a chance to maybe talk about a few things uh, when it comes to perspective and how we approach the study, discussion and revision uh, of times long gone. In other words, just make sure you remove your modern lenses when you approach the study of the medieval period and the classical period and what have you, period. But thank you very much as always for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the description below to make use of the amazing offer by Geology. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.